are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation. Worship you, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. We worship you, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. You are good. Thank you for your presence today, God. You are good all the time, all the time. You are good, you are good all the time, all the time. You are good, you are good all the time, all the time. You are good, you are good all the time. All the time, you are good. You are good. Your word all the time. Pray, Jesus, we all worship the time. you, God. You are good. Thank you, Jesus. You are good. All the time, all the time, you are good. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. We praise you this morning, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. We give you praise this morning, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. We worship you, Lord. For who you are. We worship you. We worship and praise you this morning, Lord. Accept our praise, Jesus, and worship. Thank you for your presence, Lord. We honor you with our worship and praise, Lord. Amen, amen. What a privilege to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Buenos dias. Gloria a Dios. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's take the next few minutes and greet those who are around you. Welcome them to the house of the Lord this morning. God bless you.
Lord, exceeding joy. Your grace fell like the rain and made this desert live. Your light broke through my night, restored exceeding joy. Your grace fell like the rain and made this desert live. Your light broke through my night, restored exceeding joy. joy. My sorrow into joy. Your hand lifted me up. I stand on higher ground. And your praise, your praise rose in my heart and made this valley see. Your very hand, your hand lifted me up. I stand on higher ground. And your praise, your praise children, God. It's our privilege to lift our hands to you in worship. That's why we clap our hands to praise you, Jesus. Thank you for who you are, Lord. You're great and greatly to be praised, Jesus. Accept our worship this morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated this morning. We're going to have a time of prayer. We've been reading out of uh, a book written by Beth Moore. It's called Praying God's Word. It's volume one. And I wanted to read a couple excerpts uh, from the chapter about overcoming pride. And it says, perhaps no other spiritual obstacle is quite like this one. Why? A simple reason exists for its Goliath proportions. Pride is Satan's specialty. It's the characteristic that most aptly describes him. Pride is the issue that had him expelled from heaven. It's still one of the Satan's most successful tools in discouraging people from accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in some ways, Christians have to be more alert to pride than anyone. 
we're wise to remember that Christ never resisted the repentance center, center rather. He resisted the religious proud and the Pharisees. Pride is also not the opposite of low self-esteem. It's the opposite of humility. We can have a serious pride problem that masquerades as low self-esteem. Pride is self-absorption, whether we're absorbed with how miserable we are or how wonderful we are. And lastly, a quote from Oswald Chambers, pride is the deification of self. So this morning in our prayer time that we have every service, let's take a few minutes and remember that uh, pride is an obstacle and um, we don't want it as a Christian, right? It prevents us from being blessed by God. So this morning in your prayer time, whether it's turning around where you're at or coming forward, let's turn this into a house of prayer and let's remember that as, as something to pray about. Let's do that together.
to him. Lord, we're careful to give you praise and glory that you're due. You're great and greatly to be praised, Father. There is no one else, Lord. No one before you and no one after you. You alone sit in heaven, God. You're our strength giver and peace giver, God. We honor you with our praise today, Jesus.
you today, Lord. Astounded by your Hallelujah, mercy Jesus. and love. Oh, we love you, Lord. We thank you, God. Our hands are lifted oh, high we love you, Jesus. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. Your grace for oh, me hallelujah, is Lord. always enough. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. There thank is you, no Jesus. One Today, there's no one higher, there is no, one no one greater, greater than you. no one but the Lord. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Praise. Oh, we love you, Lord. Such a great face. Savior today. There is no hallelujah! One hallelujah! Than you. Come on, clap your hands to the Lord. A little bit of a voice of triumph today. Somebody just. Tell him, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I'm so glad he inhabits the praises of his people of Israel today. Amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. There is no one greater and no one higher and no one more able than the God that we serve. Amen. Amen. It's great to be in the house of the Lord today. We do have several guests. Before we welcome the guests today, I just want to go through the announcements real quick. First, I want to thank all of you that made it to the Texas Roadhouse fundraiser for the Pursuit Youth. Uh, the managers there said we were the best church fundraising people that ever showed up. So it really is about Him, right? It's about Jesus. It's about letting our light so shine. And, you know, they just, you know, through all the havoc at Texas Roadhouse. Through all the noise and crunching on peanuts, uh, they felt the, the Lord through, through us. Amen. So it was more than just a fundraiser. It's about letting our light so shine. Amen. Next Sunday, September the 2nd, all church picnic in the evening. So that's at 6 p.m. It'll be in the back over here where the BCM building where the volleyball court is and our over hang tent, whatever we're calling that these days, but it's going to be a great time next Sunday, September the 2nd, remember all church picnic in the evening, and then two weeks from today, Sunday, September 9th, 10 a.m., we're going to kick off our Spanish church, Iglesia Betel, amen, esta arriba, upstairs in the Hebrews Cafe, which we're going to be changing the name, but it, it's going to be a great time, we've been having just some just awesome time in prayer and door knocking, and we have some Spanish-speaking guests with us today, so we would want to give you an Iglesia Betel Bienvenido, right? Something like that? So we give them a Bethel welcome. We also want to welcome, we have Jessica with us today. I don't know if her children are here, Naomi, Joseph, and Cynthia. Jessica, we give you a Bethel welcome. I do see some children smiling. Okay, everybody's pointing way over here. Okay. I have to look at all of you. You just have to look at one person. So, God bless you. Glory a Dios. All right. And then we have Bradley with us today. Brad, it's great to meet you this morning. Coming all the way from Louisiana. God bless you. And then we have Donna with us today. God bless you, Donna. Let's give uh, the round... Of oh, applause to the Lord, a Bethel welcome to all of you. God bless you for joining us today and worshiping the Lord. We love to celebrate the things that God is doing, and there's nothing more important than someone experiencing the new birth, born again. I don't know about you, I was tired of being born the first time, so I tried being born again, and that was the ticket. So we want to celebrate with a few, a, a couple here. We want to celebrate with Bella. Bella was baptized in Jesus' name. <laughs> Bella also received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Come on up, Bella. Amen, amen. We're very proud of you. Amen. Remain standing also. Kathleen received the Holy Ghost. And uh, let's see if I can say the name. Eswitha. Kathleen. 
Amen. Keep on clapping to the Lord. Receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. She's not this shy. Amen. Amen. As we remain standing, let's the ushers prepare this morning for a Sunday morning tithe and offering. Amen. Sunday school offering, adult offering. Let's pray together. God, what an incredible spirit we feel in the house today. God, thank you so much for all that you're doing in our hearts. God, we can do nothing, absolutely nothing without you. And we're asking you to continue to pour out your spirit, not only upon all flesh, God, but this church, and this church family and extended family, God, and those that are watching live streaming. God, I pray they feel the Holy Ghost today and what's happening. And, and if they can make it to the house of the Lord, God, if they can make it to the church, God, I pray you draw their spirit that we would be one united family in the building, God. But until that time, we ask you to bless, God, and keep us safe. Bless our offering and tithe today and all the commitments, God. It's all just giving back to you, Lord. You are exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask and think in our life. Thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said in Jesus' name. Follow your ushers from the back to the front. Continue to worship the Lord. Somebody say, the Lord is good. Tell them, the Lord is bigger than I give him credit for being. Amen. Somebody say, God is bigger than what I think he is. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, no, really, God is bigger. God is bigger than anything that you can imagine. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad that he is entered into the realm of undefinably big. Amen. He is undefinable. He has no measurements. You can't measure his greatness in length, in height, in depth. God is a big God. Amen. Somebody say, he's a big God. Big God. Amen. Now, do you really believe that today? 
Is there anything God can't do? Is there any problem too big for God? Any challenge that God has, has to try a little harder to get over? No. Oh, he's a big God. Amen. If you have your Bible, I want to um, turn to Luke chapter 8. Good to be home. Dropping my two eldest children off in Indianapolis. And I think they were ready for us to go. We were giving them so much information, so many instructions that they were like, okay, okay, bye. But I have no regrets, and I thank God for His power working in my children. His grace working in our lives, His grace in this church. You have made a difference in their life, and I thank you for being faithful to God because you're not just blessing you, you're also blessing my children, so thank you. Amen. Luke chapter 18. Verse 2, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. There was a widow in that city. She came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. He would not for a while, but afterward he said within Himself, though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. Shall not God Avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them, or though what they are asking for or needing is delayed. Verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them Speedily. Somebody say speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? God bless you. You can be seated this morning. I'm uh, amazed at this scripture that a widow came to an unjust judge, not once, but the Bible lends us to believe that she continually came to the judge. It doesn't say it within the context of the words of the Bible, but there is something that is screaming from the text this morning. And that is that this woman evidently thought that the judge had the capacity that the judge had the power to fulfill her request. And because she believed he had the power, she decided within herself, my actions are going to mirror my persuasion. This judge is able, and I'm going to continually come to the judge so that he'll hear me. The Lord compared this and he said, listen to what the unjust judge said. Because this woman continually pesters me, I'm going to give her her desire. And then he says this, nevertheless, 
when the Lord Jesus returns, or when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith? Somebody say faith. Faith in the earth. How do you say faith in Spanish? Faith. Faith. All right, faith. I'm like, wow, that's pretty easy. Will the Lord find faith in the earth? Well, what an absurd way to tell a parable about a, 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 a widow and a judge that didn't fear God and that relationship and then end up the story and say, will there be faith when God, will he be able to find faith? Will he perceive faith in the earth? I'm not, I'm not sure this morning that we need God to be convinced that He's God. I don't think that God has an identity crisis on His hands about Himself. I don't think He's lost. I don't think He's worried about His power. I don't think He is questioning or second-guessing Himself and what He has done and is doing in the earth. But I do believe that the question is poised to the earth. And the Lord asked this morning, will he find faith in the earth? Hmm. So there is evidently, and I look around and I see a lot of people saying, I believe in God. Somebody believe in God this morning? I believe in God. Say, I believe in Jesus. A lot of people, in fact many people say, Yo, I, I believe in God. And yet, there is no widow-esque action in these people. And I find in the Word of the Lord, and a question from the Holy Spirit this morning, will the Lord find faith in you when He looks down from heaven today? Will He find faith in you when He returns to the earth? There is a huge discrepancy between our words and our actions. Amen. A huge discrepancy. Our words boast of greatness and power, but our actions under the surface are small and do not testify to the same thing that our words boast. We're a shark above the water, but we're a minnow below the water. We are boasting of two total separate things. While declaring with our mouth that we believe in Jesus, do we tend to shift or shut off emotion when bad things happen? Do we run to hiding places and close our eyes? and just wish everything was different. Maybe it was a close friend that moved away and we're left seemingly without hope or companion. Maybe a church member is backsliding and, and, and we uh, just kind of slump down in our chair. Maybe a friend gets cancer or is sick. And may, I don't know what your circumstance is this morning. Uh, maybe it's a city, and this is true, that is broken because of sin. I'm not sure what yours is. But when we come across things in our life, and we all have them, do we just throw our hands in the air and say that's just the way it is and that's just the way that it's going to be? Do we adjust our reality to the moment? I've found that when we do this, we are surrendering our hearts and our minds and bowing to the God of circumstance. I found even in my own self that sometimes because uh, of, of circumstances that are contrary to, to my life and contrary to where I am, I find often that it's my goal to just keep my emotions nice and neat and tidy and not have to search for any answers. And I find that I bow my knee to time and chance. 
And I, and I surrender without a fight to the God of time and chance. And the Holy Spirit moves me the last several days to try to shake me and remind me that my circumstances do not have the final say. That time and chance do not have all power and authority. That there's some discrepancy between what I say with my mouth that God is awesome and the actions that you see coming out of me. Can I remind you of James chapter 2? James talks about the discrepancy, as it were. James chapter 2, verse 17, Even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show you my faith by my works. James wasn't saying here that I'm going to try hard to produce works. James was saying that there is a place where what I say can line up with how I act. That while we live in a world of people whose words are worth nothing because they are void of any action that reflects the passion and conviction of their words. There is a people and there is a place called faith that what we say we believe to our core and it flows out of us in our actions. And there is no discrepancy seen. Show me. Someone say show me. How can we surrender to time, chance, and circumstance when we serve our kind of God? Our faith, if this is the case, is in, cloud, in the cloud and exists only in thought. But James said, faith without works is dead. It is misplaced at best. And this kind of faith is an indictment to the confession that we make with our mouth. With our mouths we confess Jesus, but with our actions we serve money. Our mouths confess Jesus, but with our actions we serve pride. Our mouths con confess Jesus, but our actions uh, confess circumstance or position. Listen and hear the voice of the Holy Ghost. It is time that our faith becomes more than just empty words spoken. But in the face of all of life and all of life's circumstances, there is an expression of true faith. Let me say it this way. Our perception. Let me say my perception. Not, not the reality of God, but my perception of God. My perception of God's greatness. Someone say greatness. My perception of God's ability. Someone say ability. My perception of God's power of, uh, uh, is visible in how I act. What I do is the true definition of what I believe. Hello. What I do is the truest reflection of what I really believe. We live in a world that 
flips that on its head and says, what I think is really what and who I am. But God says, no, what you do is a reflection of your core conviction. Let me say it this way. If our prayer is infrequent and sporadic, what does our actions say about what we believe? Oh, I believe in God. I'm going through a problem. Can I tell you there's a discrepancy between what you say and what you're doing? We are either in rebellion against Jesus or our perception of Jesus is that he is incapable of hearing us and he's incapable of doing anything about where we are. If your prayer is sporadic at best, your actions are telling us what you believe. Did not God's word say in 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in Him if we ask according to His will. He hears us. Uh, did you hear me? If we ask anything according to His will, Heaven's ear hears every syllable. Woo. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. Where is your faith? I find the deeper the mess we get in, the less we pray. I find the, the, the more challenging the circumstance, the more we turn to other people and we're reaching out and failing and God's saying there's a discrepancy in what you say and what you believe. Oh, I want to be a believer today. I don't want there to be a discrepancy in what I say about God and how I act that He's God. Catch this one. We are silent in our praise. We are either in rebellion against Jesus or our perception of Jesus is small. Why? Psalm 150. <laughs> Buckle your chin strap. Because this is going to hit you right between the eyes and it's not me, it's the Holy Ghost. I want to read it from the pages of the Word of the Lord, not my notes. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Here it is. Are you ready? Buckle your chin strap. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise is the response of a conviction of the greatness of Almighty God. And when we refuse to praise, it's either because we're rebelling or we're our perception of Him. And there's a discrepancy between what we say about Him and our actions. And brothers and sisters, it doesn't hinge around what you say. It hinges around does what you believe impact how you live
How many of you believe God is great? When's the last time your actions displayed that? I mean, I mean, is he the greatest thing that's ever happened in your life? Then why do you give job promotion a better seat than your praise? Then why do you give personal accolades a better seat in your life than the praise of Almighty God? Why is it that God often is pushed down? I'll tell you why. Because we have a discrepancy in our words and our actions. That's awesome. Say, thank you, Holy Ghost. Shall we move on? Can I say praise is an expression of your faith? Prayer is an expression of your faith. How about this? If we do not forgive, we are either in rebellion against Jesus or our perception of Jesus' forgiveness in us is insufficient. God is never insufficient. But it is our perception of God that lags and lacks. And when our perception is lacking or insufficient, our actions then move away from what we say. Colossians 3.13, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone. Say anyone. Forgive anyone. Wow. Who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others forgiveness has nothing to do with a person's right with their achieving your approval of forgiveness but biblical forgiveness is all about faith because God forgave me of all of my sin I cannot not Because forgiveness is an expression of our profession of faith. Listen to this one. If we are worldly and sinful in our lifestyle, we are either in rebellion against Jesus or our perception of Jesus' return is faded. 2 Peter 3.11 since everything will be dissolved in this way. He's talking about the coming of Christ. What kind of people ought we to be? You ought to conduct yourselves in holiness and godliness. Can I tell you that holy and righteous living is an expression of our professed faith that Jesus is coming back for a bride. Finally, if we do not share the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ and what He has done in our lives, can I tell you we are in, either in rebellion against Jesus or our perception of Jesus is held hostage by our fear of rejection and pride. That's hard, isn't it? Is your chin strap on? That's tough. 1 Timothy 2.4 God wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Do you know that witnessing is an expression of our profession of our faith? And people that do not witness have a discrepancy between what they say and what they do. If our actions as believers are less than what they should be, 
We need not to change our action. What we need is a revelation. If our actions are less than what we say, we need something to change our perception of the God that we serve. That's why Paul, when he was praying for the church at Ephesus, if he saw someone's actions less than what they should be, he didn't say, oh God, take them out back to the woodshed and whack them several times and tan their backside and he understood that the problem was that their perception of Jesus was too small but if there is any way that a person can begin to push back the walls and the boundaries of their perception and begin to let God have more space then their actions would follow listen Ephesians That he would grant you, if Paul would pray for us, he would pray this. I pray that God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the might of his spirit in the inner man. That Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith. Watch. That ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length, and the depth, and the height. And to know the love of Christ. Paul didn't jump on them for the wrongness of their actions. He jumped on them and prayed that there would be a spirit of the wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the width, the width, the breadth, the depth, the greatness of God. I rise to this pulpit this morning to ask this question. What about Jesus? The God of the impossible. While He is never a magic wand, or He's not a -a make-a-wish foundation, He is, however, God of all. And He is your God. And He is my God. Ponder these questions that I wrote. Does He not have power to govern? Do not the very elements of nature submit under His control? Can He not speak and lightning and thunder respond? Are not King's hearts in the palm of His hand? And does He not move them wherever He chooses? Does He not have power over heaven and earth? Was not Satan defeated by Him? Is not His weakness greater than all of the combined strength of the ages? Is not His foolishness wiser than the whole of man's wisdom? Ponder with me the greatness of God and beg of the Holy Spirit to exercise His power to change my perspective of who He is. Are not His thoughts higher than our thoughts? Are not His ways above our ways? Is He not our God? Is He not your God? Has He not purchased you with His blood? Has He not filled you with His Holy Spirit? Did He not create the universe simply by the word of His mouth? We serve a big God. He is not limited by time and space. There is a God that created time. There is a God that created circumstance. And it's not over. It's not finished. I'm not at a dead end street yet until He ceases to be God. Come on, somebody's got to preach your words out of the cloud and get them into daily living. I said it's not over until God, our Lord Jesus Christ, ceases from being God. If there's sickness, 
Jesus is the physician. If there's tiredness and weakness, Jesus is strength. If it's loneliness, Jesus is a friend. If it's lostness, Jesus is both lighthouse and compass. If there's entrapment, Jesus is the door. If there's depression, Jesus is hope. If there's sadness, Jesus is joy unspeakable. If there's sorrow, Jesus is comfort. If there's perplexity and anxiety and worry and confusion, Jesus is counselor. If there's joblessness, Jesus is provider. If there's brokenness, Jesus is the repair man. If you are sin-filled, Jesus is the Savior with nail-scarred hands and the forgiver of all sins of man. If you're fearful, Jesus is perfect. And he has a love that casts out all fear. If you're under attack, Jesus is a strong tower. And the righteous can run into him and find shelter. How big is your God this morning? Would you stand and clap your hands? God, you are great. Change the perspective of my mind. Let me see you in your glory. Oh, hallelujah! Come on, let your praise, let your action match what you say. Oh, hallelujah! be weary I might be bound but I serve a God who is neither bound nor weary huh. I believe you Lord I believe you Lord too great for you. Nobody's too lost for you to reach up. Nobody's too sick. Nobody's too dead. No son's too far gone. No daughter's too far gone. No doctor's given the last word. There is a God. I don't care if they say you're barren. You're fruitful in Jesus' name. I don't care what they say. I have a God. I have a God. And I refuse to bow my knee to time and chance and circumstance. You can be seated. I've had a fresh revelation of the greatness of God. It blows my mind, but it showed me the discrepancies between what I say with my mouth and what I'm doing with my actions. I wept in my prayer study the other day because I saw the greatness of God and then I looked at me. And the words of David came rolling off my lips. Why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your hope and trust in God. begin to think about word pictures that would somehow try to communicate how great God is and how insignificant my issues are to Him. Because if you're like me, the issue is right here and the only thing I can see is the issue. And God could be all of time and space, but because the only thing I have closest to my eye is my issue, then that's all I see. And God just simply moved my issue out of the way and said, would you look at me? <clears throat> oh, 
What is this? When I perceive this. Why have I been so faithless and unbelieving? Why have I been so trivial in my pursuit? Circumstance is one grain of sand. And Jesus' power is the beaches of the world. Why are you staring at one grain of sand and letting it control your life? God's bigger than the one grain of sand. Satan is one star on the backdrop of the universe called Jesus. One star, why? Do we bow our knee to his power? The collective sum of all the problems of humanity, you might laugh at this one. I did. The collective sum, say collective sum, of all the problems of humanity is but one dollar. And Jesus' power is equivalent to the national debt of the United States of America. <laughs> That's a funny comparison, but I'm trying to get a word picture to you. I'm trying to get you to understand how great is our God. Romans chapter 11, I'm almost through. Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depth. Oh, the depth. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. The Bible uses a word here that kind of sums up what I'm trying to convey to you today. How unsearchable. Somebody say unsearchable. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Well, if I could just find out, if I, if I could just find out, the Lord said his ways are past finding out. When you get to the point that you think you found out, you just touch the bottom of God. Because he's past finding out. Thank you for letting me get a little wild today. I need to get a little bit more passionate. I know you're saying that in your mind. Anybody got problems? Would you tie a knot in this string for me, Donna? That would represent your problems. Can you hold on to that bottom of that string? Donna, how big of a God do you serve? If all of your problems are represented by that little knot, is your problem any, anything to God if God is the string? Come on, I want to put Donna, hang on to that. Oh, don't let the hit you in the face. I'm trying to give you a word picture today that our actions sometimes are less than what they should be because of our perception of God. Can I, can I ask you how big is your God today? How much string is on? How far can I go with it? I wonder if I could wrap five times around this entire congregation. This is God's power. Nobody get up and walk, please, because you'll trip. Come on, somebody. How big is your God? Come on, is this making sense to anybody today? 
Come on, our, our, our perception of God has got to become bigger than just our world. Donna, that's how big your God is. Where's your problem at? Where, did we lose your problem? Because of the greatness of God. What? Oh, wait a minute. See? Now, and oh, there it is. But look, what kind of God you serve. That's what kind of perspective God wants you to have. That's what, that's, I don't know. Your whole life is represented by that knot. You got any problems? Can I tie a knot that represents your problems? You can be in the middle of this thing. God don't care. There's so much of him, he don't even care. That's, that's your problems. They're real, aren't they? And if all you do is stare at that, you're not going to have the strength or the emotional strength. Your actions are going to start acting like this is the biggest thing in your life. But what a lie that is from hell because look how big your God is. <laughs> Got any problems? Can you tie a knot there? Church, you've got to understand something. God is unlimited. How, how many problems have can fit on this ball of, of string. How, what, where is God's end? He's past finding out. He's unsearchable. He's unknowable. You don't even understand how powerful He is. You don't understand His love. You don't understand His grace. Come on, where is your faith? When God comes back, is He going to find anybody that says, I believe in an unbelievable God? I believe... I might as well just pray. I might as well just worship. Oh, we sing about, ain't no mountain high enough. But are we going to believe it? Please don't trip over that when you, when you stand and come to the front in just a moment. One more word picture and I'm finished. I wanted to have this drop from the ceiling like magic. Couldn't figure out how to do it. <clears throat> but, just right. keep it going. There you go. Nobody's getting married. <clears throat> Now, Ashley, come here. Hold on. I need to get you something to write with. Dave, come up here. Hold this up on the altar for your wife. I want you to write what's been right here on that paper. This is your problem. This is what's eating your lunch. This is what's causing you not to sleep, mind you. This is what's disturbing your marriage. This is what you're fighting with. This is what writes yours down right there. When the Bible says, cast all your care upon me. <laughs> Do you realize that this is God? <laughs> you could write a 10-page essay and it wouldn't even come to hear says. This is how God, how big God is in your life. Come on, lift your mind up. Lift your spirit up. Lift your heart up today and let God give you a revelation. He's not bound. His hand is only confined to the outside. He can touch the womb. He can touch the heart. He can touch the mind. He can touch the invisible. He can touch the visible. He can do anything. Anybody want to join us at this altar and say, I need, a, I need a work over on my perception of God. <laughs> I want you to step over here on this side. I want you to begin to say, God, change the way I think. Don't go anywhere. Anybody else want to sign your name and your problem in confessing what God is to you?
This isn't a Christmas wish list. This is just casting your care upon the Lord. For He cares for you. Thank you. Lord, I don't want there to be a discrepancy between my words and my actions. If you come up here and sign your name, I want you to stay up here because God's given you a revelation of how great He is. Your prayers have been too small. They've been too limited. They've been so sporadic. God say, come on, is there a widow in the house? Will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith? Keep coming. As they're coming, I want to read my final scripture as musicians come. Thank you, Lord, for a revelation of you. Job 26. You got to understand Job 26. He's just listed some magnificent qualities of the boundless God. And he ends it by saying, Indeed, these are the mere edges of his ways. <laughs> One translation said, these are just the skirt of his garment. And he lists and all of you like, oh my God, how awesome is God. And then Job said, these are just the edges of his power of His grace and of His might. Just the edges. God isn't even going to have to flex to meet your need. He isn't going to have to strain. He isn't going to have to take an aspirin. He simply got to say it. That's how great our God is. Would the congregation stand with me this morning? It's time that we have faith-stained living. It's time we have true faith. And we bow only to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in the strength of our hands or in the wisdom of our own minds, or in the power, or in intellectualism, or, or in political issues, or, or, or our, our trust is in the name of the Lord. Would you lift your hands with me if you want to join? Come on, let there be a spirit of the wisdom, the revelation of the knowledge of God in our lives and in our hearts today. Perceive the width and the depth and the height of the high. I 